I'm really pleased to introduce our moderator uh, for this session on New York's Medicaid 1115 waiver concept paper and what it means for you with New York State Medicaid Director Brett Friedman. Um, our moderator will be my colleague and fellow consortium board member, Jim Mutton. Jim is the director of New York City Operations at Concern for Independent Living, a leader in the development and operation of supported housing on Long Island and in New York City. Um, Jim has been involved with the consortium since its early days when he was director of residential services at Project Renewal, where he oversaw numerous supportive housing programs in Manhattan and the Bronx. Um, and Jim also serves as secretary to the board at the Health and Housing Consortium. Um, welcome, Jim, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Amy, and hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, later in the day. We've got a very exciting session lined up for you. What an incredible couple of days we've had talking about health equity, access, re-entry, all the things that we've spent so much time on. And it's exciting that we've saved this, this conversation about the 1115 waiver till last. Um, there's a, a really wonderful opportunity here with some new dollars potentially flowing to New York to really make a difference uh, in terms of housing, equity, access, really address some of the disparities that, that we spend so much time talking about. Uh, some people, you may have heard a little bit about this waiver and some people are concerned that it's gonna be a desperate 2.0 and that community-based agencies won't have an opportunity to participate. Uh, reading some of this and hopefully hearing from Brett, uh, that's very different. There's, there's a lot of opportunity here to do some real quality uh, supportive housing and re-entry work that wasn't a part of the early district dollars. So we're delighted to have Deputy Commissioner and Acting Medicaid Director Brett Friedman here with us, who's uh, spent a lot of time working on this concept paper uh, with his colleagues and will be taking us through some slides to talk about what that's all about. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Brett. He's been uh, since November of 2019 uh, over at the Director of Strategic Initiatives and Special Counsel with DOH and uh, the Office of Health Insurance Programs. He worked uh, closely on a lot of what we know as Medicaid redesign issues and that transformation, uh, really how to recapture some of those savings and invest back into the communities. And since June, he's taken on responsibility and oversight of, of managing the Medicaid program after the retirement of Donna Frescatore. Uh, prior to his arrival at DOH, Brett was a partner of the healthcare group uh, Ropes and Gray and co-head of the firm's digital healthcare practices. Uh, he spent a lot of time advising government and non-government entities on complex uh, trans transformational and enforcement regulatory matters. So Brett, thank you so much uh, for joining us and uh, I'll hand it over to you uh, to take us through the presentation. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, hope everyone can hear me. Let me see if I can do the technological step of actually sharing my screen. Um, can everyone see the slides? Yep, you're good to go. Excellent. Wow. That when, whenever that works, I'm, I'm impressed. Um, this is maybe my 300th Zoom presentation um, since the start of the pandemic. And every time it works, I'm, I'm impressed with it. Um, Jim, thank you for that excellent introduction. Um, I'm gonna spend about 45 minutes uh, walking through um, really what our strategic thinking is here in the Medicaid program about how to improve health equity. Um, and I'm gonna try and be more practical than I've been in some of the other presentations on this topic. Um, to different groups, um, but this is really a culmination of many months of effort uh, in terms of thinking about the ways that the Medicaid program can deliver on its promise of better health equity. Um, it's been a hallmark of everything we, we do in the Medicaid program, but how do we take the different components of the delivery system uh, and the different payment authorities that we have and weave them together into something that provides a true north 
uh, in terms of you know, real strategic direction for the Medicaid program. Um, in doing that, um, I'll discuss what our strategic opportunities are for improving health equity in the Medicaid program. Um, I'll provide an overview and status of the concept paper. I'll do a deeper dive um, into some of the, the components of the concept paper, um, where we've gone for stakeholder feedback and what the current status is of the, the concept paper and, and where we go from here. Um, the hope in this meeting, um, in addition to sharing what our thinking is, is to really hear what you're thinking back as I'll touch on um, the concept paper is very much still a work in progress, right? We're always trying to improve what we do. Um, but until it goes to CMS, which we hope it will in the near future, there's going to be at least two more opportunities to provide your input so we can make this next process, this next partnership with the federal government um, in terms of waiver reinvestment dollars as effective as possible. So before I jump into the, the, um, in, into the waiver concept paper itself, I, I wanted to level set on ways that we've thought of as to promoting health equity in the Medicaid program. Um, I, I, as people who know me, I'm, I'm, I'm very list oriented. So I tried to give what I think are the top 10 ways that we think about health equity in Medicaid. And then we can then dive into the concept paper terms of how we, how we achieve some of these opportunities um, and what we're seeking from the federal government. Um, the first and most important is to promote and ensure coverage. Um, until people are receiving their comprehensive health insurance from Medicaid, there's really little we can do for them. Um, New York, as an ACA expansion state, um, as a state that's historically had a large and generous Medicaid program, um, really works to promote and ensure coverage for as many of our 20 plus million residents as possible. Um, due to certain flexibilities um, and economic changes brought on by the pandemic, the Medicaid program provides coverage for 7.2 million of the 20 plus million um, residents of New York State, you know, more than a third. And then when you take that with our integrated marketplace, including the essential plan uh, and the qualified health plans, we're up at around 8.6 million people. So, you know, 8.6 out of 20 million people receive some, receive their health insurance through Medicaid or a state-based exchange plan, which is a tremendous percentage. And, and that's really our testament to ensuring that we're there to, to enhance and preserve the safety net. We hover around four to 5% uninsured in New York state. Um, with the largest single group in that bucket being individuals who are undocumented um, and that with the federal government not allowing us to extend um, federally supported coverage for those groups. And we're always looking for ways um, outside of emergency Medicaid in order to extend coverage so we can achieve um, as universal coverage as possible. But that's, you know, that's the name of the game, right, is, is getting people into coverage. Um, the second, and I've been shifting these, these, you know, this list as, as needs arise, but um, the focus on workforce development, um, you know, we were just discussing in advance of, of signing on um, the, the workforce crisis across all industry sectors, but especially in healthcare is the worst I've seen in my 15 plus years in healthcare. Uh, it's probably the worst that many of you have seen in your organizations. Um, whether compounded by the pandemic or years of underinvestment or wage equalization or inflation, um, the ability of our of the healthcare sector to recruit um, a, a competent, well-trained workforce that wants to view healthcare as a means of effective uh, as, as as moving into an effective career ladder has been um, very very difficult. Um, it's affecting home care. It's affecting direct services um, in, uh, you know, across um, people with IDD, behavioral health. Um, it's affecting many of our of our state operated programs as well. Um, there needs to be a tremendous focus on how to grow workforce, whether through starting wage differentials or through creating a system of recruitment, retention, and advancement. And you know, as as noted by the asterisk here, this is one area that we want to focus on through through the waiver. 
Um, the third is, is better data collection system interoperability and performance management. Um, you know, maybe it's because of my digital health background, but data makes the world go round. Data results in better decision making. Um, it results in more consumer empowerment over their own healthcare. And we as a state have been historically closed off to making our data as available as it can be. Um, there are laws and regulations that prevent the free flow and exchange of ind individually identifiable health information, whether that's HIPAA, whether it's provisions of state law, but we can do more. Um, and so much of it's tied up with who can make a decision about how to access data, how do we ensure that our systems speak to one another, and how do we ensure that, that, um, that apps, right, API-driven tools are able to put data in the hands of consumers so that and providers so there can be better and more effective care management and individual level accountability that feeds into consumer empowerment how do we incentivize and encourage people to access the care environment is that member incentives is that access to information um, is that network and provider um, access and availability um, number five is we want to continue building community-based organization capacity very relevant to this convening um, and it's one of, you know, Jim mentioned DISRIP um, and some of the lessons we learned in DISRIP. Um, DISRIP was unique and innovative in its ability to provide a certain component of funding to community-based organizations that were addressing social needs um, and the social determinants of health. It was not enough money. It was, we were not good enough at getting that money out. So how do we continue to build capacity towards CVOs? This is a tremendous focus of the waiver. Number six is thoughtful value-based payment redesign that fully integrates healthcare and social care services together. Um, and this is, you know, I should really say that that, that focuses on health, not health care, but health. Um, and that value-based payment was really the outgrowth of, of DISRIP. Um, in the Medicaid space, we've been on the cutting edge of states in trying to use aligned payment incentives or alternative payment models so that providers and payers can work together to focus on the overarching health and, and quality of the services as opposed to a fee-for-service volume-driven system. In moving towards value-based payment, we missed a tremendous opportunity that we're looking to rectify in terms of trying to integrate and understand the social care needs of an individual so that they can be addressed collectively by the provider and the health plan in connection with the CBOs that address those needs. Uh, and so we'll talk about, as we go through the waiver design, the structural reforms we propose to make so that we can fully integrate health and social care together. Um, very relevant to this group is to expand supportive housing and alternatives to institutionalization. Um, the housing crisis is real and the promise of supportive housing as demonstrated by our initial Medicaid redesign team supportive housing reforms uh, and their focus on populations with um, certain diagnostic criteria um, was very effective. Um, CMS, the federal government, uh, has traditionally been loath to use federal Medicaid funding to support things like room and board, which we, we've been more effective And some of my team members, I saw Emily Engel as a special shout out, we've been getting better at convincing CMS to pay for certain components of supportive housing, especially for individuals with behavioral health needs. But until we can fund some of the core room and board, and other operational costs associated with supportive housing, it's going to be a limited intervention to address the needs of individuals who receive Medicaid. Um, and so we're looking to use the waiver to go further than the federal government has ever gone before to support our supportive housing investments. Um, number eight is telehealth and digital infrastructure. How do we use the, you know, what people have called the silver lining of the pandemic um, to effectively integrate telehealth and digital infrastructure into the care experience in a way that promotes access and increases quality. That could be telephonic services, it could be new capital investments in digital infrastructure um, so that individuals have a choice as to how they access their providers, how they access their social care, that Medicaid's available to pay for as much of it as possible so that there's no wrong door in terms of the way that someone wants to access their health care. Number nine, not addressed by the waiver, but always worth a special shout out is dual integration. Um, how do we, for, for individuals who are eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid, how do we ensure that they have a seamless experience in the way that they access benefits 
and that we can coordinate with the federal government effectively for some of the highest needs consumers. We have a whole separate work plan and roadmap to promote duals integration. But just a quick data point is that right now, um, if you look at the totality of the duals in New York State, only 4% of them are in a fully integrated health plan or the health plan that provides the medical on the, the Medicare benefits, the Medicaid benefits, um, and their long-term supports and services needs all within a single health plan. We can do better as a state. Um, we're hoping to get upwards of 10% in the very near future through you know, coordinated efforts and, and because making sure that someone has an integrated health plan um, is essential for, for creating accountability and promoting equity. Um, and finally, we need to continue our efforts for health system transformation. Um, that is um, facility support. And you'll see that in the waiver. Um, one thing that the pandemic revealed is that the, the safety net health systems that support many of our communities with historical health disparities are essential to the delivery of care, whether through a function as an anchor health system, whether as an ability to provide that emergency level care and that flex and surge capacity that's needed um, in connection with pandemics. But we need to work at solidifying and strengthening our healthcare, uh, our health system and the safety net to ensure it's there to support communities across the state um, in connection with all of these other investments in, in reducing health disparities and promoting health equity. So with that top 10 list, um, I wanted to use our thinking as a way to introduce um, the waiver. And I'll, I'll spend a minute um, and describe what a waiver is for those who are uninitiated. Um, you know, but just to, just to lay it out there, um, in August of this year, we submitted this document, um, it's on the DOH website, um, that, and, and we call it the concept paper. Um, it's really um, our, it's a statement of intent um, that when we want to do innovative things with the federal government to redesign our Medicaid program, we need to do it through something called a waiver. Um, it's, it's, a, it's authorized under a certain provision of federal law called Section 1115 of the Social Security Act, which is why they're called 1115 waivers. Um, and it gives, us, it, it gives us broad authority to fix things that are um, normally codified in law um, so we can make new investments and do um, new design new interventions that we think will promote um, better care delivery in the Medicaid system. Um, it, I call, so I kind of call it like the magic wand um, because it's such a broad authority. And so our 1115 waiver has historically authorized a lot of innovative programs in New York State, um, DISRIP being the most recent, um, whereby the federal government authorized um, $8 billion of new investments in the healthcare delivery system to do all the things that DISRIP did um, in terms of promoting clinical integration through performing provider systems and moving to value-based payment. Um, we want a new waiver, uh, and we'll talk about what's in it, that will be the successor program to DISRIP and fix um, uh, or improve upon, I should say, all of the things in, in DISRIP that were a good start, but really we need a lot more um, time, money, and effort to make a reality. And so this document, um, it was submitted to CMS in August. Um, it's not the formal application itself, right? We have to apply to the federal government to obtain the waiver and the federal government gets to approve it. Um, this document, although quite long, tells CMS what we want to do. And the idea is to invite CMS's input and feedback on the document so that they could tell us whether we're barking up the wrong tree, whether we're going down the right path, so that when we ultimately submit the application, there's a good chance it gets approved. Um, when in the former administration, when DISRIP expired and we sought to file a new waiver, um, which we called DISRIP 2.0 um, in November of 2019, right when I started in state government, um, we did not have the ability to check the CMS in advance whether they liked what we were doing. And they promptly took the application, they crumpled up into a little ball and threw it in the trash can. And they said, we don't wanna do it. So this was this is our way of, of testing a relatively new federal administration to say where we think the Medicaid program could advance health equity and to make sure they agree with what we're trying to do and how we're trying to do it. Um, the, you know, since we submitted the concept paper, CMS has released a lot more of its own thinking 
in terms of what it wants to support. Most notably on November 15th, there was an article published in Health Affairs by the CMS Administrator Chiquita Brooks Lashore uh, and the director, the Federal Director of Medicaid, Dan Sai, um, where they laid out their three themes of what they want the Medicaid program to do going forward. And those three themes, which were um, expanding access and coverage, um, promoting health equity, um, and delivering whole person care, especially for people with behavioral health needs or IDD, really aligned well with what we put in the concept paper. And CMS has said that to us. So I think we're in a really good shape um, in terms of aligning our thinking and our desires in the Medicaid program with what the federal government's expecting of states uh, in trying to use the Medicaid program to achieve bigger and better things for its population. So what's in the, with, with that background, what's in the concept paper? What's going to be in our waiver amendment? Um, we want to do um, a wholesale design um, around addressing the health equity needs that were exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, because the health disparities that exacerbated COVID um, were really were really linked to, um, you know, to, to historical, to, to those historical health disparities. We're looking for $17 billion in new federal funding over a period of five years to invest in the delivery system and to achieve the goals of the waiver. That is, that would be the biggest waiver ever approved by CMS, um, and we think it's necessary. I think it's probably, if you ask me, it's probably more money than CMS will ultimately give us, but waivers tend to be a negotiation. And so we're starting with our needs and hopefully we'll get most of it. Um, the, you know, again, we, we chose this, the theme of, you know, addressing the health disparities that were linked with the COVID-19 pandemic, because we think it aligns with the Biden administration's goals of promoting health equity and addressing health disparities through a full integration of healthcare, behavioral health, and social care. Um, it builds on our long-term movement to value-based payment, uh, but it also reflects New York's experience as being the epicenter of the pandemic. Um, you know, we, we were the one of the first and if not the earliest and the hardest hit state by COVID and, um, and it revealed delivery system gaps that we wanna to look to address. Um, but importantly, and something Jim mentioned, we do want to address some of the lessons learned from DISRIP. And, and in discussions with CMS, they really want us to lean into these, 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 these areas for improvement. Um, and those are you know, the need for regional alignment. Um, healthcare at its core is geographically oriented. We need to ensure that there's a regional alignment strategy around how to address health equity. The health equity needs in the Bronx are different than they are in the North Country. Um, they're different in Southwest Brooklyn than they are in Manhattan. Um, and so there's, there's micro regions and there's macro regions, and we need to ensure that, that the health equity interventions are customized by geographic need uh, and geographic characteristics. Um, we need more direct investment in social terms of health. CBOs were underfunded. Um, the ways that we got money to CBOs through DISRIP was insufficient. And the way that we tried to incorporate CBO services into VBP, while a very good start, uh, in terms of ensuring alignment with social care services, um, did not provide sufficient upfront funding for CBOs to really invest in their own capacity and make those services effective. We wanted to create administrative simplification by avoiding unnecessary funding intermediaries. Um, this sounds very technical, but um, if you think, if many, and I imagine many of you participated in PPSs during DISRIP, PPSs were the funding intermediary in DISRIP. Um, there was a vision around them, but ultimately they weren't a plan, they weren't a provider, um, and they weren't a service contractor. Um, and so they really, and we, we saw it with the wind down of DISRIP, they, many PPSs did not have a sustainable future after DISRIP expired. So we wanted to avoid creating new entities through which to push funding through and not serve a larger objective in the healthcare delivery system. And you'll see that as we sort of have thought through some of the, the entities that we're thinking about as part of this waiver. And then we wanted to make sure there was a deeper alignment and in funding incentives, again, across healthcare, behavioral health, and social care. So with those objectives, to go a little bit deeper into the four waiver components, uh, and, I'll, and I'll address these kind of quickly because they can get technical technical real, real fast. Um, but the first component of the waiver 
um, is that we're looking to build a more resilient, flexible, and integrated delivery system that reduces racial disparities and promotes health equity. There's five subcomponents to this goal, um, and it really speaks to, I think, a lot of the themes that we just touched on. Um, the first is the development of health equity regional organizations or HEROES. Um, unlike PPSs, which push funding through, HEROES are really regional planning entities. These are designed to promote collaboration and cooperation among the key entities in a region that are either already engaging in collaborative activities around addressing health equity or um, could um, through appropriate data exchange and collaboration. And so you'll see heroes are composed of managed care organizations, providers, qualified entities to allow for integration with the statewide health information network, social determinants of health networks or, or networks of CBOs that we'll talk about next, um, and other stakeholders, whether, uh, whether it's members who receive coverage through Medicaid, um, members of the workforce in terms of aligning workforce needs and investments. But the idea, like the old regional planning organizations and like some organizations that already exist in parts of the state, would be assigned to a ge geographically exclusive region, um, which could be small or big, depending on where the lines are naturally drawn, uh, and they would engage in cooperative planning efforts to inventory existing efforts around health equity goals and programs, as well as to develop new ones. They define essentially the regional strategic plan for how to address health equity in that area. Um, and it makes sure that DOH is not the gatekeeper in our infinite wisdom, that it's really the boots on the ground um, that, are, that are driving the, and identifying the needs of that area. Um, through a collaborative governance process and, and some funding provided through the waiver to help with those planning efforts. Um, the next entity um, are these social terms of health networks. And this is the vehicle through which we want to really invest in CBO infrastructure and capacity. And so I think a lot of your organizations, to the extent, to, to the extent you address health and housing, are going to be able to receive funding under this, under this waiver pool. But we would create regional networks of CBOs to take a comprehensive and outcomes focused approach to addressing social care needs for that region. Um, these are network entities. They could be formed as independent practice associations or accountable care organizations. Um, and they would receive waiver funding to build investments, data exchange capabilities and interoperability between health and social care data systems um, to provide a single point of contracting for MCOs to incorporate CBO services within managed care arrangements and to begin screening Medicaid enrollees in that area for their social care needs and to make referrals based on those needs. Um, and so if you think about this, in order to effectively participate um, in value-based payment arrangements, um, and you're probably, you know, you know as, as people on the ground doing the work, you're aware of the tremendous amount of infrastructure that's needed to have data systems, to be able to build for services, to be able to become you know, data compliant, whether that requires high trust certification or HIPAA certification as a business associate. Um, and this is really designed to get those CBOs coordinated and get the funding necessary to have them be able to participate effectively in what is the next and most meaningful portion of the waiver. And that's advanced VBP. Um, again, as I mentioned, DISRIP was a driver towards VBP. Um, in terms of top line metrics, the state was very effective at moving its Medicaid delivery system into value-based payment. We achieved our goals of having 80% of our managed care premium dollars run through what's called level one VBP, so VBP with an upside bonus model and quality metrics, and 35% through an upside downside model. Um, and so most of our waiver dollar, most of our Medicaid dollars um, that run through managed care are now in some sort of accountable payment arrangement based on cost and quality. The problem as it applies to health equity is that we have done that mostly through total cost of care, primary care driven arrangements. So you take who your primary care provider is, that member gets attributed to an arrangement and that provider network entity is then accountable on the total cost of care basis for that, for that, for that person. Um, that leaves behavioral health, um, and other services kind of out of the mix to the extent that they don't have a good value proposition on reducing the total cost of care spend. 
It also makes high needs beneficiaries, those with tremendous social care need, less attractive because in a total cost of care model where you're aggregating the cost for the entire population attributed, um, a group of very high spenders um, because they have significant need is going to skew the benchmark. Um, or alternatively, if there aren't enough of them, they're just rounding errors. And so, you know, the, the MCO is not going to be incentivized appropriately to really address the needs of those beneficiaries. So what we want to do through the waiver is provide additional incentive dollars um, that could be paid through MCOs when they enter into special populations or population specific VBP arrangements to address individuals with the highest level of social care need. Um, these populations could be individuals who are leaving the criminal justice system, um, individuals who are experiencing chronic homelessness, um, children in foster care, um, children with significant HC, uh, home and community-based services needs. Um, and there can be customized VBP arrangements that align with the goals and objectives of the hero in that region that when the MCO enters into an arrangement with an appropriate composed network of providers and social care providers, will provide additional waiver funding that can pay for the interventions that exceed what is normally contained in the MCO premium dollar. So it's funding that is integrated within the premium dollar, but can go to pay for things that are necessary to address the higher needs of the population. So things like additional care management costs, additional provider reimbursement costs. So if a provider needs to spend more time than what we would traditionally reimburse as part of a normal e &M visit, that funding would be provided. And then most importantly, um, funding for CBO services and connectivity. So funding could be paid for the housing um, as part of these VBP arrangements. And we like this structure because we think CMS will approve of it because when you make money available through the MCO premium dollar, it loses its agency. So that CMS looks like it's paying for premium, but then the premium turns around and pays for housing. Um, and because the housing is, ne is a necessary element to addressing the total healthcare spend of that individual who's attributed to the subpopulation arrangement. So this is a way to move um, in a meaningful way to encouraging accountable care for populations that are traditionally hard to reach and hard to address. Um, a core component of this process is a really innovative feature, which has been periodically tested by CMS and others over time, which is this concept of a social care needs assessment. So as a, as a component of any of these arrangements, we would require um, the member to be assessed for their social care need utilizing a uniform tool. Um, and that would have a really critical that would serve a critical function. The first, it would, it would allow us to accurately, um, accurately capture the race, ethnicity, and other demographic criteria of that individual. We have historically very poor data on the race, ethnicity, and other demographic features of our Medicaid populations um, because a lot of it's self-reported or just not collected at all. Um, it's only about a 60% capture rate, uh, and that doesn't even speak to accuracy. Um, and that has a real impact on our ability to, to, to address health equity uh, and address health disparities because um, we can't substratify by race, ethnicity, or other characteristics if we don't know who the people are. Um, and so part of doing a uniform social care assessment process, we think through a community health workforce, would one, be able to allow us to capture the demographic, demographic information to allow for better quality measurement on a stratified basis, which is where NCQA and others are going uh, on health equity measure sets. And two, it allows us to incorporate the social care needs in the person-centered service planning process that health plans are already required to engage in. So the social care needs, just like their health care needs, right, whether they're diabetic, whether they have had cancer, um, can be incorporated in the care plan that the, that the managed care plan is responsible for creating. And so they would have a service, a service authorization for CBO services like they have a service authorization for personal care services or for specialty care services. Um, and that really incorporates the, the, the network of social care providers of CBOs 
into the network like healthcare providers are. And then over time, because of the uniformity of collection, we can start risk adjusting the plan premiums by the level of social care acuity of their respective membership populations, which is a tremendous promise. So if Health First has a population cohort that has, that has greater social care needs, greater food insecurity, toxic stress, job insecurity, then Fidelis, we can then risk adjust Health First premium so that money is baked into their dollar and they're encouraged to continue investing in those services to keep their members healthy. So this is a real big ticket conceptual redesign of how our managed care delivery system works, our expectations on managed care plans and providers, and utilizing the fact that 80% of our Medicaid enrollees receive their services through managed care and incorporating these social care design features into the fabric of what makes our Medicaid program tick. Um, it's beautifully incremental, as we call it, um, but and it's logical um, because it's not developing anything new. It's making what we have much better. Um, other critical elements of our health equity investments are building training capacity. We want to make sure there is adequate numbers of community health workers, care navigators, peer support workers that are going to support the work of the social care integration into our managed care delivery system. The individuals who have to complete those social care assessments, the individuals who are going to provide the additional care management and supports that are able to address the needs of these special populations. We're going to need a whole lot more of this, you know, developing workforce. Uh, and I've seen, you know, folks from RNYC on who have done amazing work in the CHW space. Um, but we need more of those workers because they're going to make this, this whole delivery system redesign tick. Um, and then we have a, a, an eligibility expansion for criminal justice of all populations. Uh, and it's a reflection of how we envision these value-based payment redesigns by allowing for Medicaid enrollment for incarcerated individuals 30 days prior to release. Um, we can then ensure that they're incorporated effectively into these population-specific VBP arrangements when they're released. Um, and that's, you know, it's, it's an example of one population to be addressed. Um, the second major investment um, in the waiver, we're anticipating $3 billion of the $17 billion total to the extent that CMS agrees, is to develop additional supportive housing and alternatives to institutions for long-term care and behavioral health populations. Um, under this waiver design, um, and I think this section will be probably most compelling for many of you on this, on, on this webinar, um, is that the HEROES entity, that regional planning entity, would conduct um, an inventory to map existing efforts, um, including you know, supportive housing that exists, identify gaps, and inform a plan for access for long-term services and supports and healthcare to individuals so that they can receive, receive services in their community and age in place. Um, the HEROES would also then identify housing and community-based service solutions for areas and populations where gaps exist, not just the LTSS populations, but populations with behavioral health needs, um, with HIV and AIDS, with other needs that speak to specific population cohorts. Uh, and they would work to coordinate the, the housing component uh, as part of those arrangements with MCOs and SDHNs and local governments that oversee the local housing programs. Um, there's so many different funding streams for housing, whether it's city-based, whether it's state-based, whether it's through um, you know, federal government like HUD, the, you know, we would expect the heroes to help identify and connect those solutions. So that's the inventorying effort. And that would be the role of the HEROES as part of the regional planning. Then the second component would be a statewide housing and home-based services initiative. Um, we would work to consolidate and expand the array of supportive housing and medical respite programs across state agencies. Um, you know, we, we help operate programs across OMH and OASAS. Um, DOH has it. Um, and how do we develop a better menu so that we can consolidate those supportive housing and, and respite programs so that we're all working in a coordinated fashion. And then we would work to provide that menu to HEROES, SCHNs, MCOs to implement locally uh, in partnership with the housing entities and other stakeholders. Um, we would be able to fund those arrangements through the VBP, um, fund, fund the housing through the VBP arrangements we discussed on the earlier slide. Um, we can make direct payments via the HEROES um, for some grant as well as we would seek uh, and, and we would help them access new federal housing funds that become available. 
Um, and finally, and this is in some ways where we're trying to push the needle the most, um, is to try and fund new things under the waiver that have historically been foreclosed to Medicaid funding. Um, critical time intervention models, um, expand available housing related reintegration services, including housing navigation and support services, tenancy support, as well as importantly, pay for one time barriers to housing, which sort of bleeds into the impermissible room and board categories, but things like first and last month's rent, security deposits, application fees, and make other direct rental support payments. Um, right now, if you think about the annual support of housing costs being about $25,000 a year, um, you know, we can probably get supportive housing coverage for seven to 8,000 of it, but how do we continue to, to bring down um, that the other components of supportive housing costs through running it, um, running through the Medicaid space um, because it's so integral to providing um, holistic health for individuals that tie to the Medicaid delivery. And, and we have tremendous, we've had tremendous success, albeit with limited investment, through our Medicaid redesign team supportive housing investments. And we're really looking to continue those investments as part of a waiver and expand upon them in, in a regionally coordinated way. Um, the third component, and I'll spend a little bit less time on these, is the preparation for future pandemics. Um, this is mostly a, a facility-based investment in hospitals and other healthcare facilities um, to ensure that they're ready for the next pandemic, um, which include investments in things like physical infrastructure preparation and planning, um, inventory planning to ensure that they have adequate ventilator capacity and PPE stock, um, and then cross-training of workforce so they can shift and flex in the event that, that that's required to respond to future pandemics. Um, but importantly here too, um, and building on some of our workforce investments that we're making as part of the Home and Community-Based Services uh, American Rescue Plan Act funding, we want to focus on regional workforce needs coordinate with, with workforce investment organizations and other training entities to develop a more robust healthcare workforce. Um, there'll be planning um, involving a variety of stakeholders, uh, including local government entities, labor organizations, providers, um, which can include many of your organizations and CDOs. Uh, and then we would fund targeted interventions to address workforce recruitment and retention. Um, so really here is to develop, is to do a few things, um, to develop new career pathways. How do we ensure that when someone enters the healthcare field, there's an adequate stepping stone up the career ladder, whether it's through paid training, tuition assistance, so they can continue to develop higher skills that will result themselves in higher pay. Um, how they can be trained to participate meaningfully in some of those new VVP initiatives, right? Can you go from uh, home health worker to community health worker to physician assistant, to, you know, and sort of up the ladder. Um, overcoming training to help overcome implicit bias. Um, programs to include um, to improve things like ethnic concordance. Understanding the importance that access to services um, should may be improved when the provider field looks like the population that they're serving. Um, creating additional training standardization across the state. Um, and really trying to use the healthcare field as a means of addressing economic insecurity in the workforce that serves the Medicaid space. Um, and, and that's really, you know, we want to invest a lot of money. In, and this is probably the bucket of the waiver that's increased in prominence since we started designing the waiver earlier this year, where we think more of the waiver money needs to go to do really innovative things in the workforce investment space. And there's things that we haven't thought of that we want to keep soliciting input and advice on. Um, and finally, the last component of the waiver um, deals with um, creating a statewide digital health and telehealth infrastructure. Um, I touched on it earlier. There's not much more to say, but you know, we want to make sure that there's additional funding to expand technologies that help promote healthcare access, um, whether it's remote patient monitoring, data platforms, and data interoperability, including including uniform standards of social care exchange, social care data exchange, um, having more patient-facing tools um, such as tablets and remote monitoring devices. Um, and the development of specialty virtual care models um, that, have, that, are, that are proven effective um, and improving quality and reducing cost. Um, we haven't developed this concept paper in a vacuum. Um, many of you, I think, have been part of discussions already that you've had with me or others um, on our team um, in terms of thinking through what we can advance with CMS. We've met with consumers, providers, managed organizations, CBOs, advocates, industry leaders, uh, as well as our state agency 
partners as well as our city agency partners, especially in New York City, but in all other local, also local health districts. Um, more feedback is always welcome. Um, where we are in the process right now, and it's important for the feedback loop, is that we've put the concept paper out there. We've met with CMS a few times. They provide some feedback. We're incorporating that feedback as well as some feedback that we've received since submission of the concept paper. We're converting the concept paper into a formal application. And that starts the, so, so there's time now to make sure that we, you know, get all the input um, and, and, you know, other, other advice that we, you know, has either evolved since we, you know, developed it or, or, you know, or that we're missing. Um, but then we'll submit a formal application and that requires transparency under federal rules. So there'll be a 120 day public comment period uh, and we'll hold two formal public webinars, virtual hearings, if you will. Um, and we'll be able to solicit that feedback. And then after the 120 period closes, we submit the final application to CMS and then it goes through another 60 day process. So assuming we can start this formal notice process at the beginning of the year, um, we're hopeful that we'll be able to get the, C the, the, the waiver um, eligible for CMS review by the middle of next year uh, and hopefully approval you know, shortly thereafter. So we're really kind of aiming for an end of 2022, early 2023 launch date where we can start building on these arrangements. Um, we're building on additional specificity, right? Turning concept to application, um, trying to refine concepts. It will have to go through extensive negotiation with CMS. They don't spend billions of dollars of their money lightly. Um, but we really think that this puts New York's Medicaid program on an innovative track to do more cohesively to address health equity and to promote whole person care. Um, and so the next steps is we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll continue to validate our direction and approach. Um, we'll make sure the duration amount and the demonstration objectives are aligned with what CMS wants to do. And I discussed sort of where we are timeline for submission wise. That could slip here and there depending on how well we do and how many other competing priorities we have within the state. But, you know, we're really excited for the opportunity. We're really excited to discuss it you know, with this group and with you uh, and to answer questions. Um, but it's I think a really, um, you know, it's, it's really trying to think about the needs of, of, of members who receive their services through Medicaid, um, you know, where the needs are generally and the ways that we can do better on delivering on the promise of Medicaid. Um, and, you know, again, happy to answer any questions and, and, and hear your thoughts. So I'll stop sharing um, and we'll take it from there. Brett, thank you so much. Very, very interesting. We had a lot of questions coming in while you were talking. Um, I'm going to try and uh, pitch a few to you. Uh, we've got quite a bit of time, actually, to questions, which is great. Thank you for, for doing that. Um, so a couple of questions came in about the sort of the mechanics of defining a hero and a region for the uh, SHNs. I mean, I'm assuming there may be one hero for New York City. Is that how we're seeing this? No. Okay. No, no. So, so there's definitely going to be one hero per area, right? Unlike PPSs that overlap with one another and would often have like a food fight. Like I think there were four PPSs in the Bronx, for right. example, right? And that, that created a lot of tension around attribution and, you know, who did, who competed with what. Um, you know, we... You know, there's there's sort of nine historical regional divisions in New York State, right? North Country, Finger Lake, Southern Tier, Capital Region, Downstate, Long Island, etc. Um, we'll start there in terms of the major regional divisions, and then we're going to sub sub regionalize, um, and we'll work with local health departments, right? I've had extensive discussions say, in New York City with New York State Department of Health and Mental Health, a lot of you know sort of granular population level analysis around where there are natural lines of demarcation. Um, and we're not establishing a minimum number or a maximum number. Um, I guess we are establishing a minimum number, which is nine, but I, you know, I, I think it's gonna be somewhere between nine and 20. Um, but I would think that there would be, you know, one hero for the Bronx. There may be two or three, you know, I think there's gonna be one hero for Staten Island. That's a very natural, De, you know, geographic demarcation. Um, but, you know, there could be two heroes in Brooklyn, right? Because the population of North Brooklyn and Southwest Brooklyn are very different. Um, and, you know, how 
you know, the, the lines tend to be fuzzy, but, um, but our, our vision with heroes is there's one hero because they're going to have to produce, you know, a plan and an inventory for that area. But we want the, but we want the lines to be drawn with the right amount of specificity to ensure that you're really capturing distinct regional need. Um, and so I would think we would have, you know, more than three, fewer than 10 heroes in New York City. That's good to know. And then along with that, the uh, the networks, the SHNs, you know, are we thinking that existing PPSs might jump into those or, I mean, would there be any capacity on how many of those in a particular region? Um, no, I mean, ideally we would have a single SDHN per region um, because you'd want as comprehensive a network of CBS services per area as possible. But, you know, one thing as we've done our research on the waiver, um, we have been really heartened to see a lot of our vision of SDHNs grow organically out of PPS. Um, the Alliance for Better Health is a really good example of one that I think has been, you know, sort of, you know, and, and what Dr. Ryder did in the capital region, um, I think he's really focused on the, the CBO components to build an IPA network that I think would, would meet, you know, would qualify regionally. Um, you know, entities like EngageWell IPA, um, which, has a, which has an HIV and harm reduction focus um, in New York City would be another sort of good example of one that's growing. Um, I, you know, at the end of the day, we want to make the contracting process as streamlined and simple and non-competitive for CBOs as possible. So that's why we want fewer. We don't want you know, a million IPAs forming up and then CBOs right. figure out if they're exclusive or non-exclusive and how it's going to work and which arrangements. But um, I don't, one thing we don't want to do is to prevent anyone from stopping the work they're already doing. Um, and I think in the CBO IPA space, there's a lot of good work. Um, I was involved in it in private practice. And, yes. uh, you know, you, you know, we, we want to make sure that that is, you know, that continues. And so I don't want to say pure regional exclusivity, but we certainly want cooperation. And the good thing about VBP contracting and IPAs is you could stack them. Um, so, you know, you can have meta or mega or super IPAs. And so, you know, you could have, you know, different, you know, local governance coming together and sort of arrangements that work for everyone. And so, um, you know, I just, you know, really it's getting those investment dollars to build the CBO capacity and then having the contracting vehicle to participate effectively in VBP. Yeah. I mean, we saw in uh, under DISRIP, we saw some really interesting work going on with CBOs and hospitals, you know, and that, that those pilot programs were pretty instrumental, you know, working with high utilizers, uh, getting people off the streets and housed and post disrip that kind of dropped off the map on the, on the hospital budget. You know, it would be nice to be able to revisit some of those designs. Um, one question came up about, you know, how we do inventory, you know, when we're looking at something like housing and, you know, not just taking the supportive housing landscape uh, among city and state funders per se, but looking at, you know, coordinated entry systems that already exist. You know, the city has done a lot of work around a single point of entry system um, and really taking that into consideration, but also looking at people that are on subsidies. You know, there are so many households right now that are, are relying on, on rental subsidies to get housed. You know, we've seen some local legislation uh, impacting the rates of those subsidies, um, but there's still a whole cohort of people who unfortunately are not finding rentals uh, because of the subsidy that they're on. Um, so I don't know if you have any thoughts about that in terms of how we do inventory. <laughs> I, you know, that, that's, a, that's certainly a, um, a big question. I mean, part of the funding for supportive housing is to do that inventory. Um, and, you know, supportive housing for me is a new area. And, and I'm, I'm thankful that I have members of my team 
like Emily Engel, who's I think on this call, um, to really help and you know provide the historical context and lens for supportive housing. But you know, one thing is as I'm getting smarter in the space, um, trying to 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 weave together the different housing programs, both for capital and operating support, is just a tremendous challenge. And to figure out where the investment dollars go that are going to be most effective in getting people housed. And the thing we want to avoid in the waiver is creating unfunded mandates um, in connection with medicating these services. Um, and we're seeing it a little bit now in the behavioral health context where we're doing better at getting some, some Medicaid funding for the supportive component of the supportive housing services but what does that mean for purposes of, of claiming and billing, compliance requirements, other obligations that the housing provider has? Um, and can we, you know, can we minimize that burden while improving capacity? Um, and are we providing adequate funding for fair market rent when, um, when you know, the costs of everything seem to be increasing exponentially overnight? Um, and I think that's been the struggle in the supportive housing space, which is so hard to get the committed state and federal dollars in the mix. Housing costs go up um, and are never quite where they need to be to provide adequate housing stock. So how do we how do we increase flexibility under the waiver to to eliminate those delays? And part of you know that to me you know, and, and I, I'm sort of approaching this like a lawyer, so I apologize, but part of the beauty of value-based payment, putting aside its complexity and its challenges, is that it's a very flexible authority to pay for things using Medicaid dollars that we want to pay for because they address overarching health. Um, and so if in this situation, a managed care plan thinks that this member is going to, you know, can't be discharged from the hospital, because of the lack of, of, of stable housing, um, you know, the, the waiver design will give the MCO and the, the provider network underneath it, the ability to, to find quickly, um, you know, whether it's a medical respite space, whether it's a supportive housing program and to establish one quickly without as much red tape as it would be if we're trying to support it through other state and federal dollars. So it's, it's nimbleness, it's person focused care, with the right levels of wraparound support um, is really the vision we're trying to achieve while we don't preclude some of the larger scale housing investments. And, you know, we're certainly having discussions around them now with the state budget to ensure that, you know, because it's really one of the critical interventions for improving overarching health. Yeah. What about people that are spread between regions who we'll say a community provider have to a contract with a specific hero or original, you know, is there a worry that people will get stuck in certain regions and end up waitlisted? No, so there's no contract with the heroes and that's an important distinction, yeah. right? The heroes yeah. are a participatory enterprise, right? It's to say, you know, if you are, you know, if you have substantial operations in an area and there's a hero in that area, you want to be at that table to talk about the needs of the region. But let's say you're a provider that has housing in the Bronx and in Yonkers, right? Yeah. And you can cross a region, even though they're similar demographic makeup, right? Um, you could participate in both heroes because you have core operations in each. There's no contract, there's no funding directly, but you're there at the table to make sure that your opportunities are heard. And those can then be funded through SDHNs and through the VBP arrangements. So, um, you know, it's, it's designed for flexibility across regions. Um, and it's really incumbent upon the organization given their size and scope in an area to participate in one or both. Um, you know, there could be, you know, you could have like a one-off operation in Queens and say, you know what, it's not really worth my time. Whatever's going to happen there, I'll lop on on, as opposed to if you're a big provider in the Bronx to make sure you're really at the table there. Great. Some larger uh, sort of fundamental questions about the role of Medicaid in housing. You know, somebody asked, you know, do we really need Medicaid to pay for housing? I know, I know we talked about the the role of the federal government, or is it better to really divert those dollars into supports within housing? Um, 
any thoughts on that? That's, I mean, I would love anyone's thinking on that. I mean, it's things that keep us up at night in terms of the ways to approach housing. I think we, um, you know, historically, CMS and the federal government has said, we will not pay for a room and board at all, right? And they're still, I think they're still there, right? Because with our, with our HCBS spending plan, um, you know, there were certain of our proposals that, especially in the IDD space, that looked like they were providing, you know, paying for room and board. And CMS still said no. Um, you know, we've seen some, you know, flexibility on the margins. Um, but we do think that housing without the support, um, you know, should, you know, is, is, is not really what we're looking to fund. Um, you know, I'll give an example in real time, which is we're looking, you know, we're, we're looking um, at, you know, new senior housing funding. And what should be the, the you know, sort of the co-located programmatic elements of that senior housing to improve, you know, overarching, you know, o, o, you know, o, you know to, to improve our overarching goals in the Medicaid program, which is, you know, from in the LTSS sense, deinstitutionalization. Um, so do we want to mandate, say, a PACE center being located in, you know, as part of that housing program as a foundational element to awarding funding for that development? For, or for the ongoing operating expenses. And, um, you know, I, I think understand, you know, and, and, you know, we're trying to get smarter at this in, in sort of the Medicaid space, which is what are those core programmatic elements that we think need to either be available in the housing or even, you know, as part of the housing in order to make sure that individuals are able to remain in the community um, and, and have fewer, you know, health episodes, you know, whether hospital you know, psychiatric admissions. And so I, you know, uh, I think we're open to where the industry is heading. Um, you know, again, with the, with the concern and caveat that if we try and medicate too much of it, um, where we could be imposing obligations in terms of billing and compliance that aren't worth it for the dollars that come with it. Right. Uh, so we're talking about building uh, Medicaid capacity, you know, the issue of eligibility comes up there are, you know singles uh, families with young children that may not be eligible there's also folks you know who are aging in place uh, who, who may need home care but their income restricts them from Medicaid any any thoughts about how we can tackle eligibility issues um, eligibility issues are um, forefront in our mind um, especially as we think through the next. One of the biggest, I think, eligibility gaps we have in the Medicaid program right now is on the ABD population. And so, you know, if you're in the, if you're in a mainstream plan today, um, your income eligibility is 130 of the FPL. Um, and then when you become um, eligible for, you know, as a dual, we actually then test you at 87% of the FPL. So you, so we, drop the eligibility requirements pretty substantially with an asset test. And that results in people losing their coverage simply because they're aging out of, or they're aging, I should say aging into Medicare. Um, and, and that, I, I think it's the aging in place type of element that, that you're speaking to Jim. And, and it's something that needs to be fixed. Um, and it's something that we're looking to fix um, as, as a priority because it does to number nine of my top 10 list, I think it's a core element of duals integration. It's a core element of, lo of not losing eligibility enrollment um, and you know, better weaving together our marketplace integration and coverage that has been so, you know, I mean, the legacy of my predecessor, Donna, you know, the, the fact that the marketplace in New York is so robust um, and the marketplace options are so integrated, I think is really, um, is really remarkable and we need to do more of that and in, including through addressing those income eligibility gaps and those asset tests. Um, we are precluded for, you know, right now from implementing the 30 month, um, 30 month look back for eligibility for CBLTSS. Um, and that's going to probably continue in perpetuity um, until, you know, federal law permits us. So um, we're, I think we're doing what we can uh, and we have, we have identified that that you know that 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 ABD gap that we want to try and fix, and and you know we're we're advancing proposals to do so. Great. Uh, valuation is popping up, guys. If you want to take a look at that, um, 
you you talked strongly good, about good scores, building. please. Good scores. <laughs> you talk strongly about building workforce capacity. You know, focus on training, uh, workforce development. You know, there's there's a a plug there to to also tie that in with uh, retention, with salary, you know, with with pay rates. Uh, to look at you know how you are addressing various workers in the system you know we've got uh, folks doing care coordination that are are paid a, an abysmal rate right now and really trying to make sure that that we're building capacity for for the workforce as a whole here yeah so I know that, and, I know that's on yeah. your agenda yeah workforce is you know and, and and we'll see what the governor does and her state of the state address, um, which is now um, scheduled for January 5th. But, you know, we expect that there to be a tremendous movement on the executive side for workforce development. Um, you know, as we think about in the Medicaid program, there's two means of addressing workforce issues, or there's two strategies, right? The first strategy uh, I'll call entry wage differential. Um, you can, you know, when, when we have a almost statewide $15 minimum wage, um, you know, and, and we pay most entry level healthcare careers are at that minimum wage, whether it's home care, um, some of the care management capacity. Um, healthcare is a com comparatively hard career. It's more meaningful, but, you know, being a home health aide is, is much more, you know, I would say is, is more difficult in a lot of ways than it is to be, you know, to, to work in other aspects of the service, service industry. So we think it's, you know, we think there's a critical element, at least in certain components of the healthcare field, to have some entry wage differential. Um, so that comparatively, a healthcare career is attractive as a, so that you choose to enter into a healthcare career as compared to, you know, fast food um, as a ter probably terrible comparative example. Um, the other is then, and we discussed a little bit in the waiver, is, is once you enter into the healthcare career, to improve the experience and to improve the mobility. So it's a real career ladder um, and you will stay in the, in the healthcare workforce. Um, and so we can do that through various pay programs like shift bonuses, hero bonuses, retention bonuses, um, which you know, is something that we're supporting, um, especially on the home care side. Um, but you also have to create uh, a training and education ladder um, with the ability to ascend, you know, different milestones so that, you know, it becomes a sticky career. So um, you've been doing a lot of it on the long-term care side, but, you know, if you're a home care worker, right, you come as an entry home health aide, can we create an advanced home health aide category or a senior aide category that will result in pay increases and encourage individuals to get more skills and training while at the same time paying for that training, paying for it takes to take that training. Um, and so there's a recognition that, you know, this is a job and a job ladder that will be a source of, you know, sustainable economic growth for the individual. Yep. So that's the way that we've been viewing our workforce policy development is, um, is one, you know, let's think about what we can do, you know, unfortunately wage differentials and COLAs are hard discussions to have because they're so blunt and expensive. I think they're important, um, but that's why I think, you know, I know Jim, you were saying it right, as long as you've been in your career, like I, I you know, I think COLAs were basically wound out when I entered the healthcare workforce 15 years ago. Um, but, you know, COLAs are really hard and when they do occur, they're very, very small because they're so widespread and expensive. But same thing with, with base wage increases that, you know, those are, you know, you know, hard, they're, they're impossible to undo. Um, and they're very, you know, um, you know, like, uh, you know, every dollar, um, every dollar uh, in a home care wage that we pay essentially results in about $450 million of additional state spend, right? I mean, it's, you know, it's good given the massive size of our home care workforce, for example. Um, and so we need to be able to do those very judiciously and ensure that there's support long-term from a state budget perspective to do that. Um, you know, in terms of the career ladder, um, you know, we, we're, we're excited as to the promise. Um, the department announced um, a couple of weeks ago that we're releasing our first tranche of workforce investment dollars for home and community-based services. 
This is specific to long-term sports and services. OPW is doing its own, so is OMH. Um, but we are, you know, we're, we're investing 341 million in, you know, through Lixas to build these workforce development tools and tell us what's effective. Um, there hasn't been a tremendous amount of research that we've seen that's compelling to say, if you do this, this is what's going to result. Um, so we're hoping to use this federal money, which is really a gift of the Biden administration, to test, you know, to fund and get money into the pockets of workers, um, and, but it also to test those interventions that help promote career accountability and growth. But there's a magic bullet, and I think that's very um, enervating to all of us. Great. And, you know, something we've talked about over this convening is, you know, the power of uh, using folks with lived experience and peers in our industry and how we can continue to professionalize that career ladder for those folks. Very well said. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like there's going to be some some additional room for input. Uh, you know, people were asking on the chat about, you know, trade association input seems to be across the board with the, the follow-up sessions that there'll be an opportunity for various parts of the industry to, to respond to you and your work group. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we um, you know, we're, we're always open to receiving feedback, but um, when the application has been converted from the concept paper, which will be similar, right? So the concept paper is sort of a good guide to understanding where we think we're going. Um, there'll be at least a 120 day period um, as well as two formal, at least two public sessions whereby we can, we can, you know, you know, ensure we get that feedback. Um, you know, we, we want to, you know, I, I, I've been working very hard personally, um, you know, really since uh, the late spring to make sure that we've been meeting individually to solicit feedback as well as to make sure our concept paper is well known. Um, transparency is a hallmark of this administration and one that, we, that I'm working very hard to ensure that we, that we keep. And so um, I understand that, you know, we, we, we know a lot in the Medicaid program, but we don't know everything and we probably don't know most things. And so really the perspective of people on the ground um, is really what's gonna drive the most practical and meaningful interventions. And that's, that's really what we wanna hear. Great. Well, Brett, it's, uh, it's gone uh, quarter two and uh, We've had a great discussion. We're very lucky to have you on board on this. Thanks for all your work in getting this out. We look forward to a continued discussion.